All right, hello everybody. So um, we should probably get started now so we keep to, to time. So um, thanks for coming today and, and um, kind of see what uh, we're all doing and working towards here at the Perkins. Um, what, my name is Ryan Lister. I run a research lab here at the Harry Perkins Institute. And what we work on is um, our genome and understanding how diff information within the genome is used in different types of cells um, to create the complexity of, of our bodies and how that can work normally and also how it can be disrupted. And so what I'd like to talk about today is some of the, the biology of this and why we study this and how it can uh, be disrupted or disordered in disease states and what we might do about this, some of the new technologies and techs, techniques we use to, uh, and to approach these and to try to develop new, new methods for um, remedying disruptions to our epigenome or cell states. What we work on, a lot of what we would work on collectively as an institute is trying to understand the complexities of uh, our body, essentially the normal ways that our bodies develop and also when the processes go awry. Uh, each of us is made up of, I think the last estimate was 38 trillion cells and a huge uh, diversity of hundreds or thousands of different cell types that make up all these critical processes and, and tissues and organs of our, of our body. Uh, and one of the central questions that uh, biology is trying to deal with is how these hundreds of different types of cells that we find that make up our body uh, come from essentially the information that's encoded in just one genome sequence, where uh, basically this, all your cells have essentially the same genome sequence in them and the same information contained within them. So by, we could um, think of this as a similar way uh, as, a, as a bunch of Lego pieces. The human genome contains you know, roughly 20,000 or so different pieces. These are genes and they encode RNA that is a, the instruction to make a, a specific protein. And so in our genome we have about 20,000 different genes encoded and we can think of these as different pieces that have different functions when they're made into proteins. And different pieces can be put together and used in different ways to make uh, structures, cells and tissues which have uh, very different uh, functionalities. So just as you can put these parts together in many different combinations, our bodies, our cells, uh, turn on or off different combinations of genes in different types of cells to give each different type of cell a particular form and function. So one of the main questions that we and, and others are interested in then is how does a cell control which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off? So we have these genes encoded within the ACTG of the genome sequence, as we've known for some time, but in addition to that, we now know that there are other layers of molecular information sit on top of the genome called the epigenome. These are, for example, chemical tags that can be attached to the DNA itself or attached to the proteins around which the DNA is wrapped and organized. And these are, you can think of as small chemical signposts that can instruct the cell uh, how to use that bit of DNA to perhaps fold it into a really compacted uh, structure where the rest of the cell can't access it and use it, or to open it up and make it accessible. Okay, so these little tags can be added to our genome and provide essentially signposts on how to use the, the underlying sequence in the DNA. One of these that's been studied a lot, and which we work on in particular, is called DNA methylation. And all this is is a, a CH, a carbon and three hydrogens, a methyl group, that's added on to uh, the C letter in the DNA code, cytosine, uh, to form this slightly different little tag that's added onto the DNA. And our cells add this in millions of different places in the genome, uh, in every one of our cells. And through a great body of work over uh, past decades, we now know that these little tags are critical in uh, essential processes in, in our bodies, from development to the process of learning and memory, and also uh, to disruption of cellular states in the formation of cancer these, and, and progression, these tags can be highly disrupted and disordered. How this is thought to work is that usually you have a gene encoded in the DNA and it's copied into RNA and that RNA is then read and um, translated into a protein. Without this methylation around the gene, this process happens and the gene is turned on. But if the cell adds these little chemical tags of methylation around the gene, then it can turn the gene off. So it's a way that you can flip the state of a gene from being turned on in a cell to off or vice versa. So we can think then of the epigenome and these little tags as somewhat being akin to punctuation marks for the genome. Um, and you can see the effect of those 
if you change punctuation just very slightly, it can change uh, the, essentially grandma's fate, or, uh, and it can have negative consequences or potentially uh, positive consequences. So these slight changes to the, how you interpret uh, information and use the information are really critical uh, in, in how uh, our bodies achieve this complex utilisation of the information in the genome. What, the, what we have then in the, within a cell in the nucleus and the chromosomes and the DNA is that the DNA can be wrapped up tight around these proteins uh, called heterochromatin, or it can be opened up and made accessible and the information encoded in the ACTG letters be used. And the, these can be switched back and forth between. So if in a particular cell type, you take any set of genes, you might find that some of them are closed up and not used, but other genes are open and accessible and unwrapped and can be used by the cell and turned on. And if you take any different type of cell, a neuron or a cardiomyocyte or a skin cell, and look throughout all their genes, which we can now do with our genome uh, analysis technologies, you'd see that different combinations of genes are open and used or closed and inaccessible. So what this allows then is this um, ability for a cell to dynamically switch between how it uses information. And maybe one of the best examples of this is how we all start off as one cell, and through the process of growth and development, we become this 38 trillion cell uh, individual, and new information emerges, whereas you had a, simply a uniform cell state when we were one cell, now we have all these different tissues and cell types doing different things. And this has been envisaged in the past as cells starting out as what is called pluripotent. The cell can become uh, essentially any type, any other type of cell. And as we develop and as our cells mature and different, what they do is differentiate or specialize into become certain specialized types of cells, like a neuron or a cardiomyocyte or a skin cell. And that there are specific decision points where certain sets of genes uh, are made to be activated and utilized, and other sets of genes are turned off. And this information that's added to the genome, these epigenetic modifications play key roles in this. Now, in just over a, a decade ago, there was a, a key breakthrough that was made by uh, a researcher in Japan, uh, Shenyi Yumanaka, who found that you could actually take one of these differentiated specialized cells, like a, a skin cell from your arm, and you could turn on just four genes that had been turned off very early in development, and it would change that specialized skin cell essentially right back to an early pluripotent state where it then could be subsequently switched into different types of cells. So you take a skin cell, reprogram it into what's called an induced pluripotent stem cell, which are very similar to, stem, to embryonic stem cells, but made from each individual. And then you can trigger in a dish this cell to become any desired particular type of cell that, that you want to util, utilize um, for, for different purposes. So this gives us great opportunities in various areas. One area called regenerative medicine, where you're trying to control cell states and use them to uh, remedy dysfunction of certain cells, but also for disease modeling, where you could take mature cells from a patient, turn on these four genes, so you s convert it back into a, a pluripotent state, and isolate these, these uh, iPSC cells, they're called. These could then perhaps be um, repaired to edit the genome to repair a mutation that causes a disease and convert it into the cell type that was being affected, maybe neurons, and then uh, ultimately transplanted back into patients. Uh, they're having the mutation fixed. Or perhaps to screen for new drugs that would uh, improve uh, a deficiency in a certain type of cell that you normally can't test. Uh, we can't test the effect of lots of different drugs on neurons because in, in people's brains, obviously, because we can't take uh, tissue out of, uh, out of our, our brains and test it on it. But if you can take a cell from a patient, create neurons in a dish, then you can start to test a, an enormous number of different drugs and, and how they affect the function of that cell. Okay, so we know then that this information uh, is plastic, that it can change between different cell states during development, and it's also really important for how our cells turn from one type into another, how this contributes to us becoming these complex organisms uh, and processes of, uh, the, that we rely upon. And we know the, many of the factors that are involved in this in the, in the cell. But also we know that if these factors are disrupted and you have mutations in them, then we can get deficiencies or diseases or disorders associated with all of these, these key critical factors in our, in our life. So, 
uh, why it's Im important then to research and to, to study and understand the epigenome is because these epigenetic changes underlie these fundamental processes both in our normal development but also they're disrupted in various disease states. And what we aim to do is to use a, a variety of approaches to uh, first read where these millions of modifications are throughout our genome uh, in normal states and ha understand how they contribute to the diversity and different functions of cells that we're made of, to understand then how they, they can be disrupted in disease states and how these uh, may contribute to, to aberrant cellular function, and then ultimately to try to come up with new technologies that allow us to repair these aberrant states. So if you have these tags, t chemical tags in the wrong place, then to come up with new ways to correct them very specifically in the genome. Now, the challenge here then uh, is we first need to be able to know where all these chemical tags are located. But the human genome contains a billion cytosines in each copy of it, and in each cell we have two copies of it. And we want to know which genes might have these chemical tags at attached next to them and which in different types of cells and might be controlling how the genes are used. And ultimately, every single position precisely whether it has these chemical tags on it or not. So then the challenge becomes, how do we precisely identify which of the one billion cytosines, the C letter in the genome, have these uh, methylation tags? So, uh, what we need to do first to be able to do that is to be able to sequence a genome. So what I'd like to tell, talk about briefly here is some of the technologies and, that have really revolutionized how we can study genomes, uh, which we have here now, uh, just upstairs, a few levels up on the sixth floor and that have uh, dramatically changed how we can study this type of information just over the last uh, decade. So we need to be able to essentially read the information uh, that makes up our genome. Sequencing DNA just means figuring out the letters and the order of the A, C, T, G letters within the genome. But there are a lot of these. I said three billion letters long, each copy of our genome, so how do we sequence it? Well, what you use is something like this, which looks like a large, very expensive washing machine. And it has uh, little devices you use that is essentially uh, you put DNA, little fragments of DNA into, and they stick to the surface. And then it, uh, it, the machine has a way of sequencing the order of the letters of DNA for each of those small fragments. Now, an instrument like this, uh, which was released a couple of years ago, can sequence up to 20 billion fragments of DNA simultaneously in a time period of about 40 hours. Each fragment of DNA, each individual one, is about 300 bases or 300 letters of ACTG long. And so in one run of the instrument in 40 hours, that's 20 billion times 300 base fragments, which is about six uh, terabases or 6,000 billion bases of information that you can generate. So we're starting to be able to generate vast amounts of data, but also be able to uh, achieve things like sequencing our genomes that are billions of bases long in uh, less time and for lower cost. Since one human genome is about three billion bases long, then in about 40 hours you could generate enough data to cover 2,000 whole genomes one time over. And essentially this increase in technology, which has uh, gone down by a cost factor of about 10,000 in uh, the last 12 years now, has brought us to the point of being able to sequence a, a, a genome for approximately $1,000. So how this works essentially is you take DNA, so you could take some of your cells, isolate the DNA out of them, and then chop it into small fragments of a few hundred letters long. And then you put them into this thing called a flow cell, which goes into that washing machine looking instrument. And on the surface of that, this just shows one fragment of DNA, it attaches to the surface of the flow cell. But this is, uh, DNA is usually a double helix of two strands uh, bound to each other. What you do is you make the DNA just one strand, and then you use enzymes from cells to synthesize the other strand while you watch it in the machine, and you identify which base is being put in progressively as the, the complementary strands being synthesized, and that way you use these cellular machines to figure out what the order of the letters were in the DNA fragment. Uh, how this works then is that you have your strand of DNA you want to sequence, you add a little bit of DNA to start the process off, and enzymes that will find the matching base, and an A will always bind to a T, and a G to a C, and each base floating around here has a different colored chemical on it. So as each one is incorporated into the growing strand of DNA, 
the, in, the machine can read the, the ordered color. It's a, a red, a green, a blue, and a, a yellow uh, addition. Uh, and so by this process, you can sequence, figure out the sequence or the ordered um, ordering of, of which bases can make up this strand. But the key thing in this sequencing by synthesis approach is that it's doing it for 20 billion different fragments of DNA simultaneously all over the surface of this flow cell. So it generates this vast amount of information. Then we, so what we have in these experiments then, which can generate huge amounts of information, becomes a computational challenge where we take a, a genome, fragment it into many billions of fragments, and then we have to reassemble them back together and figure out where they came from. As I mentioned, this has changed hugely in recent years where uh, if you look back at around 2007, the cost of sequencing a single human genome was about $100 million. And as these technologies came along and got better and better, the cost has come down to about $1,000 now. And we're starting to see this will be used in, in regular healthcare uh, practices. Uh, there are new types of sequences also that are emerging that we're starting to explore, such as nanopores, where you put a small protein pore in, in a membrane and it threads a DNA strand through it, and uh, the, depending on the sequence within the pore, it will disrupt a current flow through the pore, and people have figured out how to use that change to figure out what the sequence of DNA is that is being threaded through it. So this area of reading uh, DNA information is, is progressing really rapidly. And this sequence, by the way, is that you can hold in your hand, and they're even making a, a small one called a smidgen that attaches to, to your phone as well. So we're seeing now these technologies uh, really uh, accelerating the, what we can do in terms of genome analysis, but also where you could do it, so you could start doing uh, sequencing in the field. We use these technologies then to understand the genetic basis of disease and mutations that might cause diseases, uh, to, for disease diagnosis and progression, tracking infectious diseases, and tracking all the other microbes, for example, that live within us, and many, many other uses. But what we want to use this for, uh, this DNA sequencing for, is to identify the position of all these sites of, of methylation within the genome. And we can do that very simply with a little trick where you take genomic DNA, so take DNA out of your cells, break it into these small fragments, and it has some uh, Cs that have these methyl groups on them and some Cs that don't. And then you treat it with a chemical that chemically converts uh, any C that isn't methylated to a T letter, but a C that is methylated stays a C. So after this conversion, you sequence the, the DNA, and wherever you find a C means that it had this chemical tag on it. So we can now, at the same time as sequencing your genome, identify where all these uh, tens of millions of tags are located throughout your, throughout your genome for the particular sample we're looking at. Uh, what, what do we use this for then? So we use these methods in a, a wide variety of different uh, context or que research questions. Uh, some of these include looking at how these uh, tags change as our brains develop and as our neurons mature, uh, as, as the brain has a very distinct epigenome, and we think that may, uh, these tags may play key roles in uh, allowing a cell, a neuron, which may have to survive for decades uh, to be able to continue to function but also remain plastic enough to uh, change its interactions with other neurons and encode new memories. But also to look at disorders that involve these modifications. So there are not only are these, these ta chemical tags on the DNA, but there are also proteins that read them and identify where they're located and then cause the genome structure to change. One of these is MECP2, and if you have a, a mutation MECP2 that disrupts the reading of these chemical tags, then it can cause uh, various devastating diseases, one of which is called Rett syndrome, a spontaneous disease that affects uh, girls. And so we're looking now at the function of how these proteins work and, and also uh, potential, uh, how they disrupt neuronal function and potential ways that this, uh, these mutations and deficiencies might be reversed. Uh, another area that we're really interested in is looking at how these tags and this information that allows genes to be used differently between different types of cells uh, changes between different, different cell states. When, a number of years ago, when we first compared the, uh, the methylome, essentially where all these tags are located in embryonic stem cells to differentiated skin cells, we saw that these patterns were very different. And essentially any different type of cell you look at has a very different pattern of where these chemical tags are located. So what we want to ask then is a question, what if you took a very specialized cell, like a skin cell, and you turn on these four genes, 
uh, to convert it back into a state which is like an embryonic stem cell, these induced pluripotent stem cells, do you completely reset the, the epigenome, or is there some residual mark of the, the cell that you began with? And what we found is that that seems to be the case. When we make these induced pluripotent stem cells, there's some memory of the original cell type uh, that remains in the genome of these iPS cells in a few thousand places, and uh, we think has a tendency to alter how that, that cell will then turn into other cell types. So if you take a mature cell, say it's a skin cell, and you convert it into an induced pluripotent stem cell, uh, then it may have a bias when you're trying to convert into different cell types in the dish to turn into cells that are more similar to the skin cell you started with compared to an embryonic stem cell which has a more even differentiation potential so it can turn into lots of different types of cells more evenly. Uh, so we've observed that this is the case and now what we're working on and what we've recently discovered are ways that you can treat these cells uh, in, in this reprogramming process so that you erase much of this epigenetic memory and the cells uh, we think are better able to perform within a dish and become different types of cells more effectively. But we're also working on new molecular technologies that allow us to go into the cell and very precisely change these, uh, these chemical tags, which is something that really hasn't been possible before. So you may, uh, has anybody here heard of the CRISPR-Cas9 technology? You know that? Yeah, so this is a new molecular technology developed a few years ago that allows you to go in and change the DNA sequence at, at particular places. What we haven't had in the past are tools that allow us to go into a, a cell and change these uh, epigenetic tags, these chemical tags added to the DNA. But what we can do is we can take the CRISPR-Cas9 system and we can slightly change the protein so that it no longer cuts DNA, which is its usual role, but instead it just binds to the DNA. And it binds to DNA when you feed it a little RNA sequence, a particular RNA sequence, where that RNA sequence, also made of A, C, T, and G, where it matches the genomic DNA, it will make the Cas9 protein go and bind to that genomic DNA. So it's like a finding feature. You can feed it a different sequence of RNA, and the Cas9 protein will bind there. But instead of, of um, cutting the DNA then, what we do is we fuse an, another enzyme to the Cas9, and this enzyme is one here called DNA3A, which can add these chemical tags to the DNA. So we, through, through doing this, we'll recruit this protein to this location in the genome that we want, and this enzyme here will change a cytosine into a methyl cytosine. And so this way we can now direct the editing of the epigenome very specifically uh, throughout our genome. Uh, and we can do this to add DNA methylation or to remove DNA methylation, and there are actually hundreds of uh, proteins within our cells that modify not only these DNA tags, but also tags on other proteins around which DNA is wrapped, um, which, will, which we can also explore making new uh, epigenome editing tools. Uh, uh, I've already done it over time, so I just think I'll skip through this, essentially showing that we now have these tools working and can, this shows us adding these DNA methylation tags at, at, the, um, at, the, at a particular gene in the human genome. Uh, so they, essentially what these are are new molecular tools that allow us to go around and throughout the genome precisely where we want and, and target specific changes where we want them. In cancer, for example, you'll find that specific genes may have uh, a lot of methylation added to them and it's not supposed to be there. In the past, we only had chemical inhibition ways uh, of treating the cells which would change these chemical tags throughout the entire genome. Now we can uh, more precisely target changes uh, using these molecular tools. So overall, what we're trying to do is uh, using, these, using and driving these various um, technological advances to uh, increase our understanding and control of the epigenome, and through that, our control of cell forms and cell functions. We study these through space in the genome, but also space within us in different cell types or in different, throughout, the, uh, throughout different tissues in us, through time as we develop and then as we age and how these modifications change and also through challenges to our bodies in disease states or in stress conditions. Now, studying this in the context of stem cells and trying to improve them for their therapeutic function, the changes that happen as we age and develop, uh, how these can be disrupted in various disease states and what we may be able to do uh, to, to remedy those disruptions. And new areas of research that we're exploring are various disease diagnoses or treatments that are based on the epigenome, 
and these uh, new frontier of epigenome engineering that allows us to repair aberrant epigenome states and enhance how we uh, can control cell functions. Uh, so that's a brief summary of the area of research that we're working in, and I hope that's been useful. I'll have you to discuss anything. Uh, thanks, Ryan. We've got uh, time for a couple of questions. Uh, so that DNA thing that was attached to the phone, is that available for commercial use? And if so, how do you use it like in the yes. field? So that is, I think it's still under development by the company. They show they've made, they haven't released it yet, but they're supposed to be releasing it soon. Um, how you would use it, so this company's called Oxford Nanopore, and the, the pore is the, what they're, essentially the sequencer. Um, what they're also making are little um, syringe type devices where you would put cells or DNA in the top and then you press it through a few layers of different purification media and then different enzymes and it, at the other end of it, it converts the DNA into a form that can go into the, the sequencer. So the idea when these uh, are eventually working is that you would put a sample in the top. You'd squeeze it through straight into the sequencer and then it would, it would produce some sequence. Um, they say they're working on it, but the little one that fits in your hand exists and people are already using this now to go out into um, into field to, to see pathogens that might be present in different places. Uh, it's starting to be explored to be used in healthcare settings for looking at different strains of bacteria that might be present in hospitals or uh, in different uh, in aged care um, facilities. So uh, whether anybody can buy one yet, I think it's a little bit a little way off. But yeah, essentially that's what we're looking at where we, it's moving from not just having single giant sequences, but also these small mobile ones uh, for which there could be a, a huge number of uses. Uh, hi, uh, great presentation. Yeah. Um, um, it's about uh, removing the metals from uh, DNA. Does it affect the Horvath clock, the readings, or that's irrelevant? Yeah, so, um, so you, yeah, you refer to the Horvath clock. So it turns out that um, you can use the, you can look at certain sites in the genome and whether they're methylated or not, and through the, whether they're methylated or not, estimate the age of people quite accurately. So it's turned out, and this was discovered a, a few years ago uh, by a guy in, in UCLA, Steve Horvath, and it, um, it turns out that it's, it's probably one of the best tools we have now from starting with a sample of any biological material from somebody and estimating what age they were. It's a really valuable um, forensics tool. Uh, it would potentially change it. So if, if, you, if you were looking at one of the cytosines that was used to estimate somebody's age, and if you targeted uh, one of these epigenome editing tools to go there and change it, then if you subsequently looked at methylation in those cells, you would get an incorrect estimate of it. Um, but these types of technologies aren't being used in people at this stage, uh, because you'd have to introduce them into into a body, into the cells, and that's potentially um, dangerous if it had some unintended consequences. Uh, and it's also very difficult to get these uh, Cas9 proteins, which are very large, into cells in people. Um, what, they're, uh, what we can do, though, is we can use them in cells in a culture dish, uh, where you can be really sure that any changes you make uh, don't have any unintended consequences and it's occurring in the, in the specific correct place. Just first of all, thank you very much. You made that sure. material extremely accessible to lay, a lay person. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, it enhanced my understanding enormously. Just can I just ask, do those methylations only occur on cytosine? Uh, yes, in us, there's, in humans, it's only on cytosines. There's some debate over whether there are methyl tags on the A letter as well, but there's very little of that if it is present. There are also different flavours of the methylation tag, so you can get regular what's called methyl cytosine, but then you can get hydroxymethyl cytosine and formal cytosine and carboxy. So with the uh, various chemical advances and sequencing technologies over the last few years, people have found that there are these different variants. Um, and they've also now found that um, they also occur on the RNA as well. So you can have a chemical, different chemical tags that are present on RNA in different places that may be linked to how the RNA is used to make proteins. So, yeah, good question. It's um, still an area that's being explored and, and discovering what, what other complex 
uh, tags and, and uh, features might be present. Happy the last question. Sure. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, how heritable uh, is the epigenetic in information? Does it pass on or does it get completely wiped out in, you know, on conception with germ cells? Yeah, yeah great question. So, um, and that's been ongoing debate for some time. We do know that in, in mammals that there are two periods in which the epigenome marks get essentially reset during development. So around the time of implantation of the embryo, you get uh, these methylation tags being broadly removed from the genome, not absolutely everywhere, but in, in most places, and also in germ cell development, in, in oocyte and sperm development, you get um, resetting of a lot of the marks as well. Um, there is the, so we, it, people have searched very hard for these, the potential of information being passed through generations. There are some studies that, um, that report, for example, uh, environmental effects on a father that seem to be transmitted through sperm to offspring and cause some different effects, but uh, the extent or the molecular mechanisms by which that's happening aren't entirely certain yet, but they're like, broadly it's, it's reset. Um, that may be different within your, your body if, if there are changes that occur in cells early in development, so in utero, then these marks can be propagated and copied through all the subsequent cells, or many of the subsequent cells that develop through, uh, and there are, there are very likely or known effects of uh, the in utero environment in potentially causing changes that can then affect the life of the, of, of the, the embryo and the offspring and, and the kid. Um, and the challenge there being that in, um, in a, a woman who's pregnant at a certain stage, uh, if, the, if the baby is female, then the egg cells are essentially starting to develop, the germ cells are developing. So you can have the pregnant mother and the daughter and then the cells that will form her daughter and you know, the granddaughter all present at one time. So particular environmental effects then have the potential to affect multiple generations. But that, that's an, like an immediate effect at that point in time rather than something that chain is being transmitted through the, through the germ line every time. Uh, sorry, we've got no more time. Um, maybe ask the question. Happy to chat afterwards. So. Okay, thanks for listening.